I'm going to talk a bit about aortic graft infections, give a little bit of an overview and, and, and the plans moving forward uh, with management of aortic graft infections. So, I, perfect. So, disclosures, yes, I speak for Gore, Medtronic, and Endologics, mostly primarily polymer-based endografts, but um, with regards to the endovascular space. But dealing with aortic graft infections clearly is a really a disastrous complication, as with any prosthetic uh, vascular graft. Uh, AGIs are defined as basically an infection of a vascular or endovascular graft, usually in the subdiaphragmatic aorta where most of the work is done. Uh, what we generally see, what's noted is that the aorta bifemoral bypass reconstructions tend to have the highest amount of infections, primarily due to being in the groin area. And that, that's why aorta biliac is uh, preferable. But we're more recently seeing them now in endografts. Um, the incidence of AGI, as you can see here, is up to 5%. Interestingly, we're seeing them in EVARs up to 1%, thoracic endografts, which I found very interesting, almost just shy of 5%, and then in open aortic repairs, around 4.5%. Uh, uh, review of the data, in fact, demonstrates that 25% of some of these patients present with a concurrent aorta enteric fistula, which uh, actually was a new uh, data point to me. Um, Presentation, again, primarily those of infection and systemic inflammatory response, uh, fever, abdominal pain. Uh, of course, if you're bleeding, that's bad news. Abscess and, and aneurysm eruption, as you can see there again, concurrent aortenteric fistula at around 25%. The risk factors are the same for most uh, surgical concerns, redo surgery, uh, redo aortic surgery, in particular emergency surgery. And then some data points noted prolonged uh, operative time of over four hours and some patient-related factors, such as malnutrition uh, and hyperglycemia. There's been some reports, but I can't seem to find odds ratios on whether uh, gender has a specific role. Obviously, uh, older patients uh, are uh, at a higher risk. What I found interesting as well to the group is that a risk factor for uh, aortic graft infections now is being listed as IR suites because uh, uh, cardiologists and uh, radiologists are starting to do endografts in um, interventional radiology suites. And, you know, as, as we all know, those are uh, clean uh, areas, but not sterile environments. And so there seems to be an uptick in endograft infections um, basically related to location of intervention. Classification is very important. Uh, I'm a, a big stickler on nomenclature so that whenever we're talking with one another, we were talking the same language. Again, they selected four months as an early uh, in aortic graft infection. Uh, late is greater than four months. And then the classic Zilagi prosthetic infection uh, classification, as you can see there to the screen left. And then to the screen right, the Samson classification, which is primarily related to infection with or without the anastomotic site or plus or minus anastomotic disruption. So it can do, discuss the degree of aortic graft infections. So let's take it from Rutherford. The pathogenesis is uh, most commonly gram-positive cocci. Uh, then to the screen right, you can see the speciation that's seen primarily, uh, and depending on location, whether it's in the thoracic aortofemoral or in below the knee. Uh, again, this is generally for prosthetic graft infections, but primarily it's that of uh, the uh, skin flora. A fungal infections are seen as well, uh, with Canada being very uh, rare. And then imaging is really uh, very important to be able to help, help identify this. There's a variety of ways to be able to image this. Uh, as you can see there uh, to the screen left, duplex ultrasound. Most commonly, we tend to use multi-detector CT, uh, which in high-grade uh, infections that are rather fulminant, the sensitivity approaches 100%, but in low-grade infections or very indolent type infections, the sensitivity is very is much lower, uh, practically not acceptable. MRI is being used. Uh, FDG PET, as you can see to the screen right, again, is also being uh, used uh, nowadays and becoming much more favorable because it's much more uh, sensitive. Um, we tend to still use uh, white blood cell scans, but you can see there's a large range of sensitivity uh, with, with using those. Again, the most difficult part coming to the imaging is whether or not it's an early course of an infection or if obviously something more fulminant. When it's more fulminant, primarily uh, imaging is used to help identify or plan operative intervention, but clearly uh, based on clinical evaluation, you can tell that the patient's got an infection and something needs to be done. So this is really what I want to spend most of the time on, and we'll discuss this, but primarily uh, Treatment is based on a variety of patient factors. Interestingly, there is still discussion for just conservative treatment. These patients are sometimes too sick and cannot go an intervention. 
Uh, for those that aren't going to go intervention, there is the, you know, the time the tested discussion of extra anatomic with uh, index reconstruction versus in situ reconstruction and extra anatomic bypass at a later time. So the timing is always the biggest debate. Conservative treatment is actually uh, very interesting. So non-operative management of infected aortic endografts or grafts, excuse me, continues to be the only choice in a variety of patients due to significant patient comorbidities, possibly a hostile abdomen and even the physiological concerns of the patient at the time. So survival is clearly poor and non-operative uh, managed patients. And there was a recent meta-analysis by Sharev, uh, basically saying 30 day mortality was 63%. Uh, which is basically seen in some other studies, which are compared with around 50% as well. Um, so there are several authors that discuss management of patients with uh, uh, conservatively with aortic uh, graft infections. And again, I found these very interesting kind of diving into the data, but some of them do percutaneous drainage, um, which uh, is, I found interesting. And then others are long-term antibiotics where they found some survival of over two years or so, but primarily, um, like I said, uh, the mortality is extremely high. There's been some interventions uh, which avoid explantation, such as sac irrigation, omentoplasty, and even those that have open uh, aortic infections with you know, endografting in an effort to temporize them for palliative management of either aortoenteric or aortobronchial fistulae. Um, again, oral antibiotics tend to be long-term, uh, but again, the mortality is relatively high with patients that are undergoing conservative treatment for aortic graft infections. Um, when it comes to surgical intervention, there's been a couple of uh, review articles and meta-analyses, and really the uh, short answer is there is a lack of enough randomized controlled data or good data to tell you what the right answer uh, is for the management of these patients, which I guess is expected. I don't think most of us are ever going to see a randomized controlled trial of patients with aortic graft infections, but I found these two papers to be very, very uh, comprehensive, and we'll go through some of the data here. Surgically, the gold standard was, uh, as with any prosthetic infection, is you know explantation of the prosthetic uh, bypass, infected prosthetic bypass, and then extra anatomic repair. So initially, by Lou and Bladsill in 1963, which was an aortofemoral bypass, and it became sorry, uh, axillofemoral. Excuse me, it went to axillary bifem in 1966. Uh, again, there was concern for not managing the uh, infected aortic uh, graft, so aortic stump blowout or graft thrombosis of poor long-term patency with the extra anatomic bypass. And interestingly, they took a, a look at this, O'Connor's meta-analysis, uh, took a look at the type of grafts used and found uh, reinfection rates as seen there, Dacron, PTFE, cryopreserved, uh, and autogenous vein grafts. Um, in O'Connor's paper, again, the systematic review that was just a few years old, basically concluded that in situ reconstruction with graft excision and obviously clear debridement of any infected or surrounding tissue with use of muscle flaps in the groins if it was an aorta bifemoral was superior to uh, extra anatomic bypass or extra anatomic repair, EAR, EAB, when considering basically perioperative mortality, uh, the amputation rates for the lower extremities and reinfection rates. And this is essentially what they came down uh, to. And I'll, I'll show some data about that moving forward. This again was taken from Rutherford. And again, the debate between excision and, and ex situ or extra anatomic bypass versus in situ replacement. And I think most of us are primarily moving to uh, either um, autologous vein, NACE procedure, or use of prosthetic with rifampin soak. Uh, or homograft rather than extra anatomic bypass if the patient can tolerate that, again, for long-term patency and to decrease uh, amputation rates uh, moving forward. Uh, the, the NACE procedure is uh, done at a variety of centers. Again, has a low recurrent infection rate, uh, very durable long-term, <clears throat> up to 91%, and there's a good limb salvage rates as well. Uh, importantly, because it's an uh, um, autogenous uh, vein, there's short-term antibiotic needs and short-term antithrombotic needs, so patients are not maintained on anticoagulation indefinitely. But again, the disadvantage is localized or relegated to high uh, volume centers. It's morbid, it's very time-consuming, and you have to have adequate vein without histories of deep vein thrombosis or damaged vein. So uh, there's a lot that goes on, but again, in, the, in selected centers, they have very good results using uh, NACE. This is a cadaveric homograft 
again, which uh, a lot of us, I think, would use whenever we find it available. I'd actually be interested to hear uh, what the group tends to do here if most people use refampin-soaked uh, prosthetic or they tend to use homographs. Um, for us, at least for, for me, we tend to use mostly uh, refampin-based just because of the difficulty in identifying uh, suitable homograft um, for the patient. And then here is, again, some of the data from, from some of these meta-analyses here. Uh, and it's, there's a lot of uh, information there, but uh, the references are available. And I'd be happy to share that with most people. But these are basically the pooled analysis that's seen uh, for 30-day uh, mortality, one-year survival for patients um, undergoing a variety of changes, either in situ repair, extra anatomic bypass, uh, and then the different types of um, conduits used for 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 by, for in situ repair and the 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 pooled overall 30 year mortality was 13.5% for patients with this problem and the survival rate was 73% and i said i left the references there let me see if this shows up again this is uh, the pooled analysis for 30 day mortality again you can see and long term uh, patient survival and limb salvage for patients here it's a very comprehensive uh, very uh, generous meta analysis that basically discusses a variety of important and endpoints, uh, whether there was complete graft, re graft removal, partial graft removal, extra anatomic uh, bypass, or in situ repair, and ultimately favoring in situ repair as uh, uh, the, uh, the superior outcome uh, with complete graft removal. Uh, in O'Connor's uh, study, which was the other meta-analysis, uh, which uh, was very well pooled, uh, basically took a look at the pooled estimates here on um, uh, after uh, uh, confounding for heterogeneity, and basically identified that uh, the mean event rates for all outcomes uh, seen there uh, were basically was 0.16 for extra anatomic bypass, 0 0.07 for refampin bond prosthesis, 0 0.09 for cryopreserved allografts, and 0 0.1 for autogenous vein. And basically, the lower value basically signifies fewer overall events uh, with a treatment modality. So basically, um, the um, uh, extra anatomic bypass, there was, it puts into debate whether or not extra anatomic bypass should remain the gold standard for aortic graft infection, and should we just be moving to in situ uh, repair. And then this is uh, the uh, one of the, the final slides here. Again, uh, they basically took a look uh, at whether or not you use the femoral vein, whether it was a prosthetic graft, or whether or not it was an arterial allograft uh, that was used for the repair and then to see the outcomes of limb salvage and survival of recurrent infection. And you can see uh, there uh, in the mid part of the table that uh, mortality was uh, least with a prosthetic, uh, 30 day mortality was least with a prosthetic graft. Uh, and in fact, one year survival was the most with a prosthetic graft. But when it comes to uh, recurrent infection, it was highest with a prosthetic graft at you know, almost double 7.1% as compared to using autogenous vein or an arterial allograft. And the patency, in fact, was really good with a prosthetic graft at 94%. Um, again, which is what most of us tend to use, uh, I would believe, with refampin soaked uh, just because of resources. So cryopreserved abdominal allografts have acceptable results. What people tend to, if it's available, as you can see here, five-year data uh, from the study uh, is, uh, um, sorry, as um, limb salvage rate, excuse me, was 89% with a patency of 80% and still a relatively large uh, uh, infection recurrence at 12%, uh, but they have low mortality and low amputation rates, which is the primary outcome of interest. Um, so patients with aortic graft infections, uh, really it's a disaster situation. Uh, it's very, very worrisome. Uh, there are the high morbidity and mortality. Uh, again, the prognosis of the patients depend on a variety of graft-related factors, patient-related factors, and the virulence of the organism that is identified. Um, so what I tell, I guess my, my, my fellows is like, it's, it's clear as mud. There's still no complete consensus as to what the right answer is. Um, I think most of us would, if the patient can tolerate an in situ inline reconstruction, it's preferable to extra anatomic bypass, and, and that tends to be the, the preferred method whenever possible. But again, a patient and physiologic related factors may make this complicated. And I think uh, that's it. Nick, that was uh, very nice. Uh, appreciate uh, uh, very uh, extensive overview of the literature. My question to you is, I saw in one of the, uh, the papers that, um, that the gram negatives uh, tend to be 
uh, have very poor outcomes with uh, uh, in situ uh, rifampin and uh, cryo. Is that what you glean from the literature? So like basically what I'm trying to say is that if you have a gram negative, uh, basically your best option is to do an ACE. Yes, that's uh, again, uh, th that tends to be the suggestion from what I have reviewed in the literature. Uh, fortunately, I've, I've, fortunately, I have not been in that particular situation, but, but I think if you have a gram negative organism, they tend to promote either doing a NACE or something autogenous rather than even a cadaveric homograft or an arterial allograft. It tends to be the case is what the suggestion is from the data that I saw. I, I think a lot of times people are, you know, we're primarily worried obviously about patient related factors and, and, and obviously graft related factors, but the virulence of the organism really can change uh, the options available for uh, the options available. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Peter's uh, on mute. Yeah, thanks, Nick. That was great overview, like uh, Ash mentioned. Uh, do you have any sense or did you encounter anything? And we've tried to get at it from some national databases, but is, is um, prosthetic graft infection more common with EVARs than with a tube graft, the old fashioned tube grafts? Uh, it's my gestalt, it is, but I have no data to support that. It just seems like we see a fair number of these EVARs that are infected uh, compared to prior to the EVAR. Uh, era when, you know, you'd see occasional aortoenteric fistulas or aortic graft infections, but pretty uncommon. I agree with you. I, and that, that is what I saw from the data and from my review of the literature. The, 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 the number of aortic endograft infections is higher than the traditional open aortic uh, tube yeah. graft repair, which is concerning because as, as you all know, we discussed this previously as a group, there is just less and less people doing aortic aneurysm repair open, via open technique, and, and especially for the people that are, that are graduating, some of them have not even seen those. So it is, it is a little bit um, concerning, uh, but that's what we saw. And again, I can't tell if that's because of the area where they're being done. Like I said, the IR suite thing was like an eye opener to me. I must admit, I never really considered that because we do all of our stuff in a, in a hybrid operating suite. But uh, to note that uh, there was a suggestion that, you know, site of surgery or site of inter intervention is, is, is a risk factor for aortic endograft infection. That is, uh, yeah, that's, that's concerning. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. There are a number of comments related to uh, patients practice or practitioners practices uh, with regards to this. And uh, I think these are good points uh, from Loey and uh, Nick. Um, and um, Daria mentioned that, you know, uh, regarding that some of these are the skin flora and again, may underscore where the procedure is done if it's not done and is a sterile and negative airflow you know, uh, environment as it should be. I don't know, I don't know if anyone else is, try, is using them, um, but you know, we started using the antibiotic uh, absorbable beads um, and we used them for the last two or three years you know, for groin infections, for all these graft infections, all these things, I think they've really changed practice because you leave them behind. You don't have to go back like we used to with polymethyl methacrylate beads. And, um, you know, you can leave Vanco and Gent behind in there. So I typically have thrown a bunch of those beads in and then done the omental wrap around it and then poured a little bit more on top just, just for good measure. Um, and then I, I mean, it makes you feel kind of good. Maybe it doesn't do anything, but uh, I don't know if I, I'm just curious if anyone else has started using uh, antibiotic beads in the, in the belly too. We, we use a lot of antibiotic beads. Uh, it's, it's our go-to antibiotic beads. Uh, we have a very specific protocol of how obviously to swab it and make sure it's negative before applying beads, um, gentamicin beads and vancomycin powder. But um, it's primarily for the groin and other prosthetic graft infections, but I haven't uh, had to use it or haven't done it in the abdomen yet. So, Dr. Yasa mentions that uh, we're often, you're right, not, we don't know the exact bug uh, in an emergent presentation. I would say if you can pretty much count on it being gram, <clears throat> gram negative, it's a, if it's an aerodenteric fistula. Um, primary, not so much. And I think true aerotitis with salmonella, you know, at rifampin so graft works great. So would you suggest, Peter, in those to just do an uh, ax bifem, an explant, or would you still do an in situ when you're not 100% sure? 
I think uh, probably a cryo or a rifampin soaked. Um, yeah. I think as your own preference. Um, and it sounds like Henry Ford does a fair number of cryo. I know Mayo does, I believe, and I think they get pretty good results. I have not had the experience with those as much, but it's but I don't in, intrinsically have anything against. But if, if Doctor, oh, if, if 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 Doctor Cabani's on, so for those that are putting you know uh, putting cryo, are you putting them on uh, like indefinite antibiotics or just perioperative or or? We've done a few cryos and we. Uh... We, we usually put them on for at least three months of, uh, of oral antibiotic suppressive afterwards. And then we get a CT scan and see what we, we got. Yeah, for us, like we, we, it's different patient by patient. Um, usually it's six months. If it's a really bad bug, uh, we tend to have some kind of suppressive antibiotics because I don't want to know if I stop the antibiotics, what's going to happen, um, yeah. uh, sadly. Yeah. Fair, yeah. Coming to antibiotic bees, I have to uh, thank Peter. I did my first uh, antibiotic bees with him when I was a fellow back when, and uh, have, have used that Nagorian ever since. Uh, I think it works really nice. As long as you don't see the anastomosis, I think you can do antibiotic bees uh, and get away with it. Yeah, Loie, I remember the run of uh, groin issues we had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have been quiet. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Nick. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you all. And, 